Well, the cat's out of the bag. Intel has just announced their 10th gen Comet Lake S desktop processors, and we already know the SKUs and the specs associated with those SKUs, along with various technologies that come with this family of processors. If you want more detailed information about all that, I'll put some links to other YouTube videos uh, from my fellow YouTubers in the description below. But today, I wanted to just sort of talk about this launch, specifically what I think Intel is doing right and what they're doing wrong. You know, I guess I'll, I'll start with saying that AMD has really changed everything. They've changed the game. They really did disrupt the market with Ryzen and now they're they're in the lead and AMD has now made, uh, has changed all the rules for what we are to expect with a modern day platform. Now Intel is playing catch up with their latest effort being the 10th gen series of processors. You know, you can definitely see with this launch the areas in which Intel is trying to respond to AMD. Certain things that AMD has going for it, Intel is definitely uh, trying to provide an answer for that on their end but then there's still other areas where Intel's falling short. So um, we're gonna start with the, the things that I think Intel is doing right. The first thing that Intel's got going for it with 10th gen is higher core counts. So this really applies to their flagship CPU, uh, the Core i9-10900K. Uh, I guess there's also the 10900KF and the 10900F and the 10900 with no confusing letters after it. So all of those SKUs are gonna feature 10 cores and 20 threads, which of course is two, two more cores and four more threads than their previous gen flagship on the 9900K. And uh, this is maybe something that we wouldn't have seen if Ryzen didn't exist. In fact, we, we saw Intel launch generation after generation with four cores and eight threads on their flagship part for many, many years. And now we're seeing their thread counts increase with every subsequent generation, thanks to competition. So uh, GG to AMD for moving the, the market forward, but it is nice to see that Intel is at least trying to play catch up when it comes to the core war. The 10900K is gonna be roughly a $500 chip, so that positions it right up against the AMD Ryzen 9 3900X, which has 12 cores and 24 threads. So AMD still has a leg up on it right there, but uh, at least the gap is closing. And hopefully, you know, as, as more time goes on, uh, future generations pass, um, we'll see that gap close even further. The core counts of the other SKUs are more or less carried over from last gen. So the Core i7s are eight core, and then you've got the Core i5s, which are six core, and the Core i3s, which are still four core. But another big improvement that uh, that Intel is making with this launch is that they're adding hyper-threading to practically their whole stack. Everything from the Core i3s up to the Core i9s now supports hyper-threading which is, uh, again, something that they're doing because of AMD, uh, having SMT pretty much enabled on virtually all of their, their SKUs. Previously, Intel reserved hyper-threading for its more premium CPUs that generally were more expensive, whereas the AMD approach is like, hyper-threading is just a thing that should just come standard. And it's nice to see Intel finally adopting that after all these years. From this, we can expect some higher multi-threaded performance with these chips, and uh, that's gonna make them a bit more competitive with their AMD equivalents. Another win for Intel in this launch is them continuing to increase their core frequencies. This is one area where Intel has kind of always had a leg up on AMD and it seems like there's no sign of them slowing down here. So they're pretty much boosting their, their, their core frequencies in two major ways. The first of which is with Turbo Boost 3.0. This is gonna be supported exclusively on Core i9 and Core i7 chips. And essentially what this does is it's, it's a boosting algorithm that identifies your two most efficient cores, the two cores that can uh, that, that are the most highly binned out of the bunch, and it pretty much boosts them. It gives them a, a nice little bump, and it does this without having to increase the voltage whatsoever. So that means there's no extra power going through your CPU. In theory, that means you're getting higher performance without any extra heat, which is definitely nice to see, especially since some of these high-end Intel chips can get pretty toasty. The max that these cores will boost to is 5.2 gigahertz, but that can be increased even further uh, with the other boosting algorithm that Intel is adding to the mix, which is thermal velocity boost. And thermal velocity boost essentially looks at your thermals and uh, assuming that your thermal conditions will allow it, it will actually provide an automated boost to either single core or all cores. For single core, it'll boost all the way up to 5.3 gigahertz and for all core, it turbos up to 4.9. The other sort of interesting behavior about this boost is that it's uh, they're just short bursts. It doesn't actually run uh, at that frequency for extended periods of time, but rather the boosts are being introduced in short spurts. So it'll be interesting to test the behavior of this further and just see how it operates. But uh, the other thing that, uh, that Intel has for this launch going for it is that it's still the fastest gaming CPU. If you want to take their flagship part, the Core i9-10900K, according to Intel, it's going to retain the same title that the 9900K did, which is 
is probably going to be true, especially now that it's gonna be boosting uh, with higher frequencies. But at the same time, the reason why a lot of people were flocking to say the Ryzen 7 3700X was because the lead that the 9900K had when it came to gaming performance wasn't vast enough for buyers to completely ignore all of the other benefits that come included with Ryzen and its platform. Will this launch be any different? I don't know, we'll have to wait for benchmark day. Kind of begs the question, how much faster in game, just talking about gaming performance, how much faster would the 10900K have to be than the current Ryzen offerings for you to make that switch? For you to be like, my next platform, next time I need to upgrade, it's gonna be Intel. Would it have to be a 20% gain, 30% gain, 50% gain, uh, at what point do you say, all right, I'm, I'm jumping ship? I'm actually very curious to hear your thoughts on that one. But uh, the other thing, the last thing that Intel has done right for this launch, in my opinion, is their pricing is not quite as aggressive as it has been in the past. If you take a look at the, uh, the, the, the chart on the Intel slide, it says that the price for the 10900K is 488, but that's price per thousand. So it's only if you're buying in bulk, uh, do you get it for that price. Chances are, if you're just buying a single part, it's gonna be closer to 500 bucks, but that's still not terrible when you look at the 9900K launch price, which was also around 500 bucks. That's pretty crazy when you consider that the eighth gen flagship, the 8700K, launched for $359, I think. That price gap was massive jumping up to the 9900K, and I think one of the ways that Intel justified that was uh, the extra core and thread count. But now we're getting that same bump of two extra cores and four extra threads with the 10th gen flagship, but it's the same price, more or less the same price as the 9900K. So uh, another example that you could look at is the Core i7-10700K, which is uh, an eight core, 16 thread part, and has more or less the same specs as a 9900K, but it's gonna be selling for around 100 bucks less. So in this way, it seems like Intel is trying to stay more competitive, but there's more at play here when it comes to the, the concept of cost between each of these platforms. And that sort of brings us into the next section of this video, which is everything I think Intel is doing wrong with this launch, or at the very least, missed opportunities that uh, I, I would have liked to see this time around. The first thing I think they dropped the ball on is having a new socket for 10th gen. Uh, it's LGA 1200 now, um, which means that you are gonna need a Z490 motherboard in order to support 10th gen CPUs. That also means that uh, if you have an existing 390 Z390 motherboard and you want to upgrade, let's say your 9th gen processor, you can't. You can't upgrade it to a 10th gen, it's just not gonna be supported, the sockets are different. So there's no backwards or forwards compatibility here, which is one area where I think AMD has really excelled and kind of uh, stuck it to Intel by having this awesome unified and scalable AM4 platform that uh, is just is just awesome. That's something that's just uh, completely foreign to Intel. So um, I'm hoping that at the very least we might see Z490 uh, have some longevity, more longevity than previous generation motherboards. Uh, for example, I know that there are some Z490 boards that have support for PCIe Gen 4, but the 10th gen CPUs do not support it internally, so it kind of hints that uh, we may see uh, an LGA 1200 future generation chip that can slot into a Z490 motherboard. We'll just have to wait and see about that. But the other thing that's kind of annoying is that Intel isn't really giving us a lot of good reasons as to why a new motherboard was required for this, for this launch. There are a couple changes to Z490, like 2.5 gigabit ethernet and Wi-Fi 6. But in my opinion, while those things are great to have, I don't think it justifies a completely new new platform. Another thing on the bad list here is Intel's missed opportunity to increase their number of PCI Express lanes. As we already noted, it's PCIe Gen 3, but we're still getting only up to 40 PCIe lanes, which is the same that we saw with last gen. This continues to keep Intel in second place in this area as third gen Ryzen is supporting PCIe Gen 4, uh, and even their, their upcoming B550 motherboards are gonna support PCIe Gen 4. Um, so that's kind of a kick in the pants. Um, but then also uh, the number, number of lanes. Third gen Ryzen has Intel beat out on this launch in that area as well. And I feel like had Intel improved the IO uh, with their PCI Express lanes, that would have at least provided a bit more justification as to why a new platform was needed. And I can't see many people getting excited to spend money on a new motherboard that doesn't do a whole lot more than their old one. Now I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this one as well, but I thought it would have been cool, uh, pun intended, if Intel had come out or announced with this launch a new stock cooler. It's not gonna shock you guys to learn that the uh, the Intel box cooler is not very good and really shouldn't even be put on a 65 watt CPU. 
the Wraith coolers for AMD have just been super awesome. I remember when they first announced them years ago, I kind of rolled my eyes and went, oh great, another crappy stock cooler. And then it turned out they were actually pretty good and offered a, a pretty decent value that saved a lot of buyers from having to go out and spend 40, 50 bucks on an aftermarket cooler. I mean, just think about how a lot of video cards are bundled with like a game code for like a $50 game. I mean, there's a reason why these companies, you know, AMD and Nvidia do that, it's because it's, it's a good selling point. And I think the same thing more or less applies in this case. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been there making a PC part picker list with a very strict budget, whether it's for myself or someone else, and just having that thought of, oh, thank God this Ryzen CPU comes with a cooler. That doesn't suck. I mean, technically it kind of sucks. Anyway, you, you know what I mean. But the point is, is that for a lot of builders who don't have an endless budget, this could potentially be a huge bonus ad. And I think that's probably a vast majority of the market are, are budget builders who don't have a lot of cash. So I think it's definitely something that Intel should consider looking into, even though it might not be uh, as important of a category as some of the other ones we've already discussed. The last item on this list is a potential negative because we don't have full confirmation from Intel yet about it, but it's basically the notion that you need to buy an expensive premium grade chipset motherboard in order to overclock your CPU. AMD Ryzen doesn't do this. You can buy a cheap, again, like a $100 B450 motherboard and drop in any supported CPU and overclock freely. Unless you're talking about the super cheap, like A320 chipset, AMD's platforms do not lock users out of an overclocking experience, regardless of how much money they have in their wallet, which I, I really support because I think, you know, overclocking is such a cool thing that everyone should be able to experience regardless of your budget. And you, don't, you just don't get that with Intel right now. Like, let me drop a KSQ chip into a $100 B490 motherboard and overclock it. That would be great. And I think it would also bring Intel one huge step closer to staying competitive with AMD's platform. Like I said before, AMD is steering this ship. They've set the bar and this is what people expect now. And anything less, you're gonna have to compensate that with something else that's miraculous. You'll have to pull a rabbit out of your hat, which I don't think Intel has right now. I don't think they will until maybe they hit, you know, 10 nanometer uh, at some point. But what I can see right now is that Intel is trying. As we discussed, they're doing some good things with this launch, keeping the prices a bit more reasonable, universal hyper-threading. At the same time, I think Intel still has a long way to go before they really see a parity with AMD in a lot of ways. So, uh, you know, I wish them the best because in the end, competition and choice is best for the customer, it's best for all of you, and it's best for me. So uh, we'll see how things shake out on Bench mark day. Stay tuned for that, but that's going to do it for this video, guys. Thanks so much for watching all the way through. If you did, toss a like on it before you go and get subscribed for more tech content on the way. Have a good one, guys. I will see y'all in the next video.